All right, guys, how's it going? Sorry it's been a while, but we're back. We're going to continue with Mr. Popper's Penguins. We're almost done, so we'll finish up probably in the next couple of days. So that will be good. Um, we're going to do chapter 17 and 18 today, but let's review 15 and 16. Um, 15 was called Popper's Performing Penguins, and that is when they were already at the palace. Remember, they had taken the taxis and they had walked all the penguins down to the palace theater to try to get a rehearsal time um, set up for the penguins. When they got there, however, the act, the main act that kept everyone's attention, that people paid money to come and see, did not show up. So they said, well, how about we let the penguins go and they'll do their, um, they'll do their uh, rehearsal and see how they do. And if we like it, then we'll keep going. Well, it turns out it was a great act. The penguins did all three of things, uh, all three of their acts very well. So the Mr. Greenbaum was very impressed with them. And so he said, great, let's, let's do this again. Um, so they were gonna pay the poppers $5,000 a week, which is really good money, um, to do this performance. They're gonna get to travel, which you know Mr. Popper was super excited about getting to travel since he's never been out of still water. And their first um, gig, their first show was in Seattle. Okay, so then chapter 16 was called On the Road. They, you know, got everything situated at their house. Oh, and they had had an advance on their money for the week. So Mr. Greenbaum had already given their money before they had done the work. He gave them an advance on their money. So they already gotten $5,000 to kind of get everything packed up and ready to go on the road. Um, so they packed up everything, got the house ready for them to be gone for 10 weeks. And, um... They took two taxis, because they had so many penguins, two taxis to the train station. Then when they got to the train station, Mr. Popper had to walk all 12 penguins through the train cars, down the middle of the train cars, through each of them um, to get to the back where the penguins were gonna be staying. And the penguins got very distracted by the people up in the berths where they were sleeping and scared quite a few people. Finally made it um, when they got there and they did their show, the uh, penguins did great. They were the first ones on the bill, on the on the list for them to go that night. They were the first ones. They did great. And then the second one was Monsieur Duval, and he was doing the tightrope walking. Well, the penguins wanted to come out on stage and watch him do this. And they were very distracting to Mr. Duval. And so was the audience, who was really watching the penguins. Anyways, Monsieur Duval lost his balance. Thankfully, he caught himself, but he was not happy with the penguins. Um, but everybody else was and really loved them. They were very entertaining and everybody laughed. So we are going to start with chapter 17 and this is called Fame. The birds soon became so famous that whenever it was known that the popper performing penguins were to appear at any theater, the crowds would stand in line for half a mile down the street waiting their turn to buy tickets. The other actors on the program were not always so pleased. However, once in Minneapolis, a, cel a celebrated lady opera singer got very much annoyed when she heard that the popper penguins were to appear on the same program. In fact, she refused to go on stage unless the penguins were put away. So the stage hands held Mr. and Mrs. Popper and the children get the birds off the stage and downstairs to a basement under the stage while the manager guarded the stage entrance to make sure the penguins did not get past. Down in the basement, the birds soon discovered another little flight of steps going up. And in another minute, the audience was shrieking with laughter as the penguins' heads suddenly appeared one by one in the orchestra pit where the musicians were playing. So the orchestra pit's like in front of the stage. So they had found a way to get there and they were kind of popping their heads up just enough to where the people could see them. And they laughed and loved it. The musicians kept on playing and the lady on the stage, when she saw the penguins, sang all the louder to show how angry she was. The audience was laughing so hard that nobody could hear the words of her song. Mr. Popper, who had followed the penguins up the stairs, stopped when he saw that it led to the orchestra pit. I don't think I'm supposed to go up there with the musicians, he told Mrs. Popper. The penguins did, said Mrs. Popper. Papa, you'd better get them off before they start biting the pegs and strings of the fiddles, said Bill. Oh dear, I just don't know what to do, said Mr. Mr. Popper, sitting down helplessly on the top step. Then I will catch the penguins, said Mrs. Popper, climbing up past him, with Janie and Bill following. When they saw Mrs. Popper coming after them, the penguins felt very guilty because they knew they did not belong there. 
So they jumped up on the stage, ran over the floodlights, and hid under the singing lady's blue skirt. I bet she was mad. That stopped the singing lady entirely, except for one high, shrill note that had not been written in the music. The birds loved the bright lights on the theater and the great laughing audiences and all the traveling. There was always something new to see. From Stillwater out to the Pacific coast, they traveled. It was a long way now to the little house at 432 Proudfoot Avenue where the poppers had to worry whether or not their money would hold out until spring. And every week they got a check for $5,000. When they were not actually playing in some theater or traveling on trains between cities, their life was spent in the larger hotels. Now and then, a startled hotel keeper would object to having the birds register there. Why, we don't even allow lap dogs in this hotel, he would say. Yes, but do you have any rule against penguins? Mr. Popper would ask. Then the hotel would have to admit that there was no rule at all about penguins. And of course, when he saw how neat the penguins were and how other guests came to this hotel, in hope of seeing them, he was very glad to have them. You might think that a large hotel would offer a great many opportunities for mischief to a lot of penguins, but they behaved very well. On the whole, never doing anything worse than riding up and down too often on the elevators and occasionally biting the brass buttons off some bellboy's uniform. Oops. $5,000 a week may seem like a great deal of money, and yet the poppers were far from rich. It was quite expensive to live in grand hotels and travel about town in taxicabs. Mr. Popper often thought that the penguins could just as well have walked back and forth between hotels and theaters, but every one of them, their walks looked as much like a parade that it always tied up the traffic. So Mr. Popper would never like to be a nuisance to anyone, always took taxis instead. It was expensive to have huge cakes of ice brought up to their hotels to cool the penguins. The bills in the fine restaurants where the poppers often took their meals were often dreadfully high. Fortunately, however, the penguins' food had stopped being so such an expanse of them. On the road, they always had to give up having tank cars of live fish shipped to them because it was hard to get deliveries on time. So they went back to feeding the birds on canned shrimps. This cost them absolutely nothing, for Mr. Popper had written a testimonial saying, Popper's performing penguins thrive on Owen's Ocean Shrimp. This statement, with a picture of the 12 penguins, was printed in all the leading magazines, and the Owens Oceanic Shrimp Company gave Mr. Popper an order that was good for free cans of shrimp at any grocery store anywhere in the country. Free food. Pretty cool. Several other companies, such as the Great Western Spinach Growers Association and the Energetic Breakfast Oats Company, wanted him to recommend their product, too, and offered him large amounts of cash. But the penguins simply refused to eat spinach or oats, and Mr. Popper was much too honest to say they would, even though he knew the money would come in handy. From the Pacific coast, they turned again east to cross the continent. They had enough time on this brief tour to touch only the larger cities. After Minneapolis, they played Milwaukee, Chicago, Detroit, Cleveland, and Philadelphia. Wherever they went, their reputation traveled ahead of them. When, early in April, they reached Boston, huge crowds awaited them and the railway station. Up to now, it had not been too difficult to keep the penguins comfortable, but a warm spring wind was blowing across the Boston Common, and at the hotel, Mr. Popper had to have the ice brought up to his rooms in thousand pound cakes. He was glad that the 10 week contract was almost up and that the next week when his birds were to appear in New York would be their last. Already, Mr. Greenbaum was writing about a new contract. Mr. Popper had been thinking, however, that he had better be getting back to Stillwater for the penguins were growing irritable. They were not having as much fun. And chapter 18. April winds. If it was unseasonably warm in Boston, it was actually hot in New York. In their rooms at the Great Tower Hotel overlooking Central Park, the penguins were feeling the heat badly. Mr. Popper took them up to the roof garden to catch whatever cool breeze might be blowing. The penguins were all charmed by the sparkling lights and the confusion of the city below. The younger birds began crowding over the edge of the roof and looking down at the great canyons beneath them. It made Mr. Popper very nervous to see them shoving each other as if at any moment they might secede in pushing one over. He remembered how the South Pole penguins always did this to find out what danger lay beneath. The roof was not a safe place for them. Mr. Popper had never forgotten how badly frightened he had been when Captain Cook had been ill before Greta came. He had not risked the chance of losing one of his penguins now. 
Where the penguins are concerned, nothing was ever too much trouble for them. He took them downstairs again and bathed them under the cold showers in the bathroom. This kept them busy for a large part of the night. With all this lack of sleep, though, he was quite drowsy the next morning when he had to call the taxis to get to the theater. Besides, Mr. Popper had always been a little absent-minded. This is how he made his great mistake when he said to the first taxi driver, Regal Theater. Yes, sir, said the driver, threading his way in and out of traffic of Broadway, which greatly interested both the children and the penguin. They had almost reached the theater when the driver suddenly turned and said, Say, he said, you don't mean to say those penguins are going to be on the same bill with Swinson Seals, do you? I don't know what else is on the bill, said Mr. Popper, paying him. Anyway, here's the regal, and they piled out and filed in the stage entrance. In the wings stood a large, burly, red-faced man. So these are the Popper performing penguins, huh? He said. Well, I want to tell you, Mr. Popper, that I'm Swen Swenson, and these are my seals here on the stage now. And if your birds try any funny business, it'll be too loud for them. My seals are tough, you see. They'd think nothing of eating a penguin or two. From the stage could be heard the hoarse barks of the seals who were going through their act. Papa, said Mrs. Popper, the penguins are the last act on the bill. You go run back quick and get those taxis and we'll let the penguins ride around a while while it's time until it's time for their number. Mr. Popper hurried out to catch the drivers. When he returned, it was too late. The Popper penguins had already discovered the Swanson seals. Papa, I can't look, cried the children. There was a sound of dreadful confusion on the stage. The audience was in an uproar and the curtain was quickly rung down. When the poppers rushed onto the stage, both penguins and seals had found the stairway leading to the Swenson dressing room and were on their way up the stairs. I can't bear to think of what's happening up there, said Mr. Popper with a shudder. Mr. Swenson only laughed. I hope your birds were insured, Popper, he said. How much were they worth? Well, let's go up and look. You go up, Papa, said Mrs. Popper. Bill, you run out to the theater and call the police and come and try to save some of our penguins. I'll go get the fire department, said Janie. When the firemen with a great clinging came and set up their ladder so that they could get in through the window of Mr. Swenson's dressing room, they were a little vexed to find that there was no fire at all. However, when they found six black mustache seals sitting barking in the middle of the room with 12 penguins parading gaily around them in a square, they felt better, so the penguins were walk marching around the seals. Then the policemen came in their patrol and climbed up the ladder with the firemen had left against the building. By the time they too came through the window, they could scarcely believe their eyes. For the firemen had put the firemen's helmets on the penguins, which made the delighted birds look very silly and girlish. Seeing the firemen so friendly with the penguins, the policemen naturally took sides with the seals and put policemen's caps on them. So. Placement caps on the seals, fireman hats on the penguins. The seals looked very fierce with their long black mustaches and black faces underneath. The penguins under the fireman helmet were parading in front of the policemen with, while the seals in their police caps were barking at the firemen when Mr. Popper and Mrs. Swenson finally opened the door. Remember they were nervous to see what had happened? Here you go. It's quite a show, I'm sure. Mr. Popper sat down. His relief was so great that the moment he could not speak. Your policeman had better get your hats off my seals now, said Mr. Swenson. I gotta go down on the stage and finish the act. Then he and his six seals slipped out of the room with a few parting barks. Well, goodbye ducks, said the firemen, regretfully removing their helmets from the penguins and putting them on their own heads. Then they disappeared down the ladder. The penguins, of course, wanted to follow, but Mr. Popper held them back. Just then the door flew open and the theater manager burst in through. Hold that man, he shouted to the policeman pointing at Mr. Popper. I have a warrant for his arrest. Who, me, said Mr. Popper in a daze. What, what have I done? You've broken into my theater and thrown the place into a panic. That's what you've done. You're a disturber of the peace. But I'm Mr. Popper and these are my performing penguins, famous from coast to coast. I don't care who you are. You haven't any business in my theater. But Mr. Green Greenbaum is going to pay us $5,000 a week at the Regal. Mr. Greenbaum's theater is the Royal, not the Regal. You've come to the wrong theater. Anyway, out you go, you and your performing penguins. The patrol is waiting outside. Uh-oh, I think he messed up a little bit.
Hmm. Well, see how it goes. Bye, guys.